Okay, how's it going everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Okay, so in this episode, I thought I'd try to say something about, uh, about the great Samuel Beckett and his seminal play, Waiting for Godot. First written in um, 1948, I think. And if you don't know, in this play, practically nothing happens, nothing is done, there is no development, and there is no beginning, and there is no end. But, um, but just to be a, a tad bit more specific, the play, which uh, takes place on an almost empty stage, consists of conversations between two vagabonds, Vladimir and Estragon, who are waiting for the arrival of the mysterious Godot, who continually sends word that he'll come, but who never does. Okay. Now, the big question everyone wants an answer to is, um, who or what is Godot? I mean, suffice it to say, a lot of ink has been spilt over that, and it's kept uh, many commentators very busy. So, obviously, he's someone whose identity is, uh, is notoriously difficult to, to pin down with certainty. I mean, uh, even Beckett himself said that if he knew, he would have said so himself in the play. But anyway, let's, let's speculate for ourselves. Okay, so I mean, maybe Godot is death. Maybe it's, um, it's silence. Or maybe he stands for something like, uh, like the self. You can certainly make a case for these. And, uh, of course, there are many other candidates as well. But, um, but here's the thing. I don't think that we should ignore the elephant in the room. Godot, quite obviously, could stand for God. And, um, to be honest, if we're going to be faithful to, to Beckett's text, it's hard not to see this in there. I mean, let's think about it. Godot is absent but ubiquitous, much like God is. What's more, we're told by the messenger boy in the play that Godot has a, has a white beard, much like God is described in the book of Daniel. Moreover, God promises salvation. Well, Vladimir and Estragon believe that Godot will, will rescue them and take them to his farm where they'll be able to sleep on straw and keep warm and then eat to their heart's delight. Furthermore, we're told that um, Godot beats people, which is why the two tramps are afraid that if they stop waiting for Godot, he'll punish them too. Now, this too obviously has some affinity with God who punishes sinners and, uh, and those who turn their back on him. So, what we see here then is that Godot actually has fairly much in common with the, um, with the God that we find in the Old and the New Testament. That's to say, he's fatherly. He can be irrational. He penalizes. And he promises salvation. But, Maybe most importantly, like Godot, he's absent. He's perpetually off stage. And, uh, well, he does very little. Okay, but then um, what does Godot as God stand for? Well, it's got to be something like, uh, like meaning or, or purpose or direction, right? I mean, obviously, that's what God and religion has provided for, for believers throughout the centuries. But in waiting for Godot, it seems a bit different. And that's because this is a play about modernity. And, well, haven't the uh, tramps heard? Today, God is dead. Well, no, they haven't heard that. You might say that they're not over the death of God. In other words, in their waiting for Godot, they're still clinging to the vestiges of this traditional deity. And importantly, because of this, they're still clinging to the idea of an ultimate meaning to life. Actually, this is what's so weird to me about uh, the many interpretations of waiting for Godot. And that's that 
In them, Vladimir and Estragon are often pitted as, as nihilists. You know, as people who, uh, who don't believe in anything at all. But no, I just don't think that's true. Rather, I think that you could argue that the two tramps are actually incapable of going on without meaning. In other words, they think that life has some ultimate meaning even in the midst of a world seemingly marked by a complete inanity and purposelessness. And it's because of this that they don't lose hope, that they keep waiting for Godot. So actually, at the end of the day, then you might say, and some commentators have said this, that Vladimir and Estragon are best described not as um, nihilistic pessimists, but as innocent, inveterate optimists. And it's this, their lack of pathos, that has been said to exclude them from the class of tragedy. Okay, but uh, from Beckett's point of view, I don't think this is a good thing, that they're uh, naive optimists. And that's because what it shows is that the two tramps are not able to, to cope with their situation. They're not able to cope with reality, with uh, meaninglessness. In, a, in Nietzsche's sense, they haven't really gotten over the death of God. They haven't gotten out from under his, uh, his large shadow. They're perpetually waiting because they think an answer will be provided for them. That there's, uh, that there's something to be discovered at the end of it all. That something external to them will save or rescue them. Again, to, uh, to bring in Nietzsche, the two tramps seem to be unwilling to face what Nietzsche calls the open sea. They're unwilling to go beyond absolutes, beyond good and evil, beyond God. They're fearful of accepting the ultimate meaninglessness of things and instead seeing it as an invitation for, for self-creation and value building. Okay, well, so now I, I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about something else. I want to say something about, um, about all the, the chatter going on in the play. I mean, there's no shortage of that there, right? All these two tramps do is continuously chatter. Okay, well, so what's the deal with that? Well, I think what's going on, what's going on with all the, the verbiage is that, well, that, that Vladimir and Estragon want to perpetuate a kind of unconsciousness or comatose condition for themselves. And this is why they talk so much. This is why there's always so much bickering and dialogue. In other words, their chattering keeps them away from or, or mitigates against silence and so therefore from any real reflection about their own lives. And um, Estragon basically says all this himself. He says, In the meantime, let us try and converse calmly, since we are incapable of keeping silent. It's so that we won't think. Actually, their fear of silence and their fear of uh, reflection their obsession to prevent any deliberation at all is so bad that when, uh, when words fail them, they're made to say, just say anything at all. And because they can always do this, they're, as one of them says, ultimately in no danger of ever thinking anymore. Now again, why do they want to do this? Well, maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because thinking means eventual responsibility and change. It means um, owning up to the world. It means to challenge life. It means to face the full gravity of oneself. But the two tramps don't want any of this. They only want the impression of existing. Their lives have no substance beyond the distractions of the moment. In this way, their outlook is the very antithesis of a questioning, conscious, existential one. 
Now, I think that the problem here, you know, uh, constantly uh, chattering, is actually an especially modern problem. I mean, where is silence today? And the sort of, uh, the sort of deep reflection and thinking that grows out of it. It seems like we're just um, too distracted and uh, too busy for, for thoughtfulness. The, the acceleration that now marks life robs us of our capacity for, for reflection. Now, I know that the, uh, the eternal silence of these infinite spaces scared Pascal too. So it's not like this is a uh, uniquely modern phenomenon. But when have we ever in our history covered up silence as much as we do today? I mean, the odd time that we find ourselves free from the perpetual din of our environment, our first instinct is to reach for our, our headphones, isn't it? With our cell phones in our pockets, we're just uh, never truly left to ourselves to think in silence. Actually, you know, it's, uh, it's no surprise that we've just recently added another um another phobia to our to our long list of them sedataphobia the fear of silence people uh, suffering from sedataphobia just can't withstand silence they constantly need noise and um and some kind of human interaction you know Sometimes I wonder what it was like before all the, uh, the gears and the fans of the industrial age. Or to go back even further, before the, uh, the carriages being driven down the uh, cobblestone streets of, uh, of ancient Rome, say. That sort of silence of long ago, well, it's, um, it's got to be completely incomprehensible to us today. No? And uh, also, sadly, forever irretrievable, I think. Okay, well, so um, now I want to I wanna switch directions again and talk about uh, what many have taken to be another very important element of the play. And that's the tree. You know, the, uh, the only form of life that decorates an absolutely barren stage or, or landscape. Okay, so, so what's the role of the tree? Why is it there? What's it, um, what's it meant to symbolize? Well, okay, so while it's, uh, it's pretty clear that the tramps wait to be rescued by this, uh, by this fatherly figure, Godot, it actually seems to me that the only sign of real hope offered comes from somewhere else. It comes from that tree and the few green leaves that have um, sprouted on it. Now, I should say that some have taken the significance of the tree to, to represent the, the cross that Jesus was crucified on. And because of this, they take Beckett to, to be suggesting that the, uh, the religious dimension is not completely gone from the world, and so there's still hope. But here's the thing. I don't think that's right. After all, as far as I'm aware, Beckett was, a, was an atheist or a non-believer. Even though, of course, in his typical way, he never put things in, uh, in neat and tidy terms, to say the least. But anyway, so, so given his atheism then, I think we can understand the tree and its little bit of greenness and its uh, rootedness to the soil as symbolic of, of some kind of this-worldly, earthbound view. So, so hope, if it comes from anywhere at all, it doesn't come from this uh, antiquated and distant fatherly Yahweh figure of the Old Testament, but from, well, from Mother Earth. And um, what, the, what the tree and the earth and, and nature represents is, is change and, and um, growth and blossoming and rebirth, the, the Dionysian spirit which is exactly what Vladimir and Estragon need. They need 
alleviation from the stasis of waiting, of waiting on an empty or ossified solution. They need vitality. They need um, a spur to, to motion and a spur to creation. Actually, you could argue that when the, uh, when the tramps see the tree as a place to uh, hang themselves on, they see it in its religious aspect. And that's because, ironically, it's their perpetual stasis. They're, they're waiting for salvation and meaning, typified by the religious outlook, that renders their current life meaningless and so therefore makes suicide an option. But to see the tree as, um, as symbolic of Mother Earth, however, is to, well, it's to accept time and so to accept life and so to joyfully take advantage of the small measure of it that we're granted. You know, for, for some reason, speculating on what this uh, tree means in Waiting for Godot gets me thinking about, um, about Voltaire's famous last few words in his great satirical novel, Candide. Now, what Candide says there, of course, taking his cue from the, uh, the Honest Turk character, is that the best thing that we can do is to cultivate our garden. Now, I think that what this means, among other things maybe, is that at the end of the day, we must look to what's local, not to some uncertain time or, or place or future when it comes to creating meaning and value in our life. That we should um, tend to the, to the few acres in front of us and turn that into a project that will, at the end of the day, put us to sleep, weary, but satisfied. And what's more, I think that to, to cultivate our garden, to, uh, to tend to our flowers and vegetables, also means that we choose to be on the side of propagating life, despite all the misery and the death that life might surround us with. Well, like I said, I think that the tree in Waiting for Godot can be seen in, in this sort of light as, well, as a, um, as a potential garden of sorts. I mean, Vladimir and Estragon sacrificed their present for the sake of some possibly greater but uncertain future or good or investment, right? That's to say, they do nothing but, but wait for something supposedly greater to come. But in so doing, they forego all commitments to the world around them. In effect, they live as if they're, as if they're dead to the world, and certainly that's how the world appears to them. Or uh, to put all of this another way, they have nothing to do because they don't have anything to do with the world. Well, okay, so, so what if Beckett intends the, the slightly sprouting tree as an invitation to the cultivation of a garden? So what if instead of looking to a, a distant future, the two tramps took stock of what's uh, immediately around them? The, the tree with its potential for, for foliage and turned that into a project. And so what if they went to bed not waiting for tomorrow, but instead satiated with the life they led that day? What if they participated in the creation of life instead of ignoring it and uh, instead clinging to the vestiges of a dead or a receded God? Okay, so um, there's, there's one last point I wanted to make about this tree. But, uh, but to be honest, I don't think it's something that uh, Beckett had in mind. So what if we see the tree here as a kind of potential stabilizing force in the lives of these two men and a way to keep their identity secure? I mean, trees are deeply rooted, right? 
and they are what they are for a very long time. I mean, uh, some of the oldest trees in the world are over 5,000 years old. Well, okay, in a desert landscape where, where the wind wipes away and, uh, and breaks down most things, one needs to fasten oneself onto something secure and reliable, right? And to be in relation to something that stays what it is, that has some kind of, uh, kind of self-sameness through time. In other words, by being related to that same tree over time and, uh, and not setting their sights on the dissipating things around them, they can retain their identity and therefore some stability. And actually, you know, I think something like this is, is pretty relevant in our contemporary world as well. I mean, today most of us live in a kind of a kind of um, erratic stream, no? Where, where nothing around us provides us with any kind of, uh, any kind of traction or hold. Everything, everything whizzes by, and so we too along with it. And so, and so nothing stabilizes us or gives us any kind of coordinates in the world. Computers and uh, cell phones are good examples here. When we look into them, there's nothing about them that, that stays the same. The content is always changing and, uh, and flickering and, and it's always restless. And so, so these objects don't ground us in the same way that a, that a desk or a, or a tree does. Desks and trees are enduring objects that stay what they are. Well, in this restless and uh, ever-changing world around us, we can recover some of our identity by, by keeping these stable things around us, no? By being related to these, to these old, familiar things, we ground ourselves in something. We stabilize our life. While the, the tempest of compulsion and production roars all around us. Bye for now.